Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Georgia Southwestern State University. I'm Professor Bonnie Levine Bergeron and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Global South Seminar. This seminar series is named after and endowed by the late Professor Emeritus Harold Isaacs. He served as a history professor here at Georgia Southwestern for 49 years. During his tenure at GSW, Professor Isaacs taught courses in Latin American history, African American history, and he established our majors in Black Studies and Third World Studies. In 1981, he launched the Third World in Perspective seminar series, and later, two years later, he established the Association of Third World Studies. In 1984, the Journal of Third World Studies followed. This journal addressed the problems and issues that faces less developed countries all over the world. Following Professor Isaac's death in 2015, the name of the journal was changed to the Journal of Global South Studies and is now published by the University of Florida on behalf of the now named Association of Global South Studies. As part of his bequest to GSW, Professor Isaacs requested that part of the monies he left each semester be used to bring a guest speaker to campus to talk to our community about the issues and the opportunities that are facing the Global South. Tonight, I'm happy to introduce Dr. LeVar Smith. Dr. Smith is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Morehouse College in Atlanta. He earned his bachelor's degree at Morehouse before getting his master's of science degree from the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. Dr. Smith went on to receive a Master of Arts in Political Science and a PhD from Miami University in Ohio. Before coming to academia, Dr. Smith spent time working in the banking sector for Care International and the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Smith also considers himself to be part of the GSW Hurricane family as he taught American government here back in 2013 and 14. His research focuses on issues of state development, international political economy, and democratization in sub-Saharan Africa. Tonight, he'll be sharing information with us on his research in Zimbabwe, and we're honored to have him with us. After Dr. Smith concludes his presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Smith. All right, how's everybody doing tonight? A little bit louder, I don't know if I can hear you. How you doing? Good. Just got off the road from Atlanta, but we are happy to be here. How are you? Good? Good. All right, so um, some of you are here for extra credit. All right, when I taught here, uh, extra credit was always preferred. Um, so for those in Dr. Beckman's class who are actually doing extra credit, um, raise your hand. I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, a lot of you. All right, that's cool. That's cool. All right, uh, where are the students that are actually in the African diaspora class? All right, good, good. So we're going to talk a little bit about Africa today. And then those that are also in the world and its people. All right, good stuff. So. Um, pretty simple. Um, I taught here, I taught American politics here um, as an adjunct professor, um, but my area of emphasis is primarily comparative politics and international relations. So what I do is primarily teach um, young people like yourselves about the world, right? And the reason why I teach about the world and I'm fascinated by the world is because most of you will find yourselves somewhere in the world, right? How many of you have an Instagram page? Right? I mean, if you post like when you travel abroad, you post your Instagram photos, right? You do? Where have you been? Mexico. Okay. Are you from Mexico? Do you have family in Mexico? Uh, I have family in Mexico. Okay. So family in Mexico. Anybody else travel globally? All right. So where have you traveled to? American Samoa, Fiji, oh. and regular Samoa. Okay. American Samoa, Fiji. Okay. Where have you? Okay, so you've, you're from Norway, but you've been where? I've been uh, to Europe, I've been to Vietnam, Okay, 
Okay, so we have some global travelers here. This is important, right? Because again, most of us will find ourselves at some point involved in the world. We'll find ourselves somewhere globally, right? But most importantly, the goal of the classes that you're learning here is to give you a glimpse into the way that the world exists, right? And really to talk about some of the issues, right? What are some of the issues that the, that the global community is actually facing, right? And then also, for myself as a political scientist and a scholar of comparative politics and international affairs is how do we write policies or how do we influence governments to actually develop policies, right, that then change the directory, the trajectory, excuse me, right, of the way we see the world, but most importantly, the way that we interact with it, right? So um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is about this whole notion of state building and democracy. Right? And I think that this is important as it pertains to Africa, because when we think about Africa, most importantly, we think about the misconceptions about the continent. Right? We think about jungles, we think about safaris, right? we think about people like Nelson Mandela. Right? Um, there's a, a famous article by a Kenyan scholar by the name of uh, Binyavinga Waringa, who recently passed away, and he writes this satirical piece about how to write about Africa. Right? And he talks about right, mentioning blood diamonds, right? talking about how people um, in Africa right, um, eat monkey brains. Right? This is whole satirical piece. It's a joking piece. But it talks about the misconceptions that we have about Africa. But also, when we think about Africa as, a, as an amalgamation of 54 states right, um, across this vast continent, we often think about Africa by the images that we see on television. Right? So the whole idea here, and in in the bulk of my work as a scholar, is to um, demystify our understanding of Africa, but also raise an issue about what some of its challenges are on the ground as it pertains to democracy and um, state building. So really quickly, I just want to thank Dr. Bragg um, for allowing me to be here. I also want to thank Dr. Begrin, who were my colleagues. Um, also. Um, Dr. Begrin as well, I want to thank you for also allowing me to be here. Um, but also, I do want to give respect where it's due um, to Dr. Gary Klein, who um, again um, took a chance on a young scholar learning about American politics, even though that wasn't my field. Um, and also to um, Dr. Isaacs himself, who was a phenomenal mentor, who um, came by my office every day, um, similar to your professors urging you to finish your coursework so you can finish your degrees and go be great in the world. He also um, really inspired me to finish my PhD. So it is a homecoming and I'm grateful to be here. All right, so it's October 2009 and I am defending my master's thesis, right? I'm working on my master's thesis at Miami University and I have on a blue sweatsuit but I'm sweating profusely, right? You can actually see the sweat coming out of my suit, right? And it's a three-piece suit, so, you, so that means that I was sweating pretty hard. Now, why am I sweating? The whole idea is that, again, I'm writing on something that I barely know something about, this whole concept of democracy, but most importantly, state building, right? And I'm trying to keep quiet because in a room where you're defending your master's thesis, most of you will work on a master's thesis or a PhD at some point, right? When scholars are talking, right, and they are engaged in these intellectual debates, the number one rule you learn is to keep quiet, right? Because you don't want them to turn that attention on to you, right? So again, I'm sweating in this room and I'm defending my master's thesis. And again, there's two scholars, right? There's Karen Dewisha, who recently passed away. She's a scholar on Russia. She focused on um, the Vladimir Putin regime and the whole idea, right, of this power structure in Russia. And then there's Dr. Jeffrey Herbst. And, De and Dr. Jeffrey Herbst um, was, wrote a book about states in Africa, where he actually talks about how the state in Africa was really created by European powers. So the way that we see Africa is primarily through a European lens and a European construction. But most importantly, the state gains the monopoly over violence and controls people and citizens within the territory based on war and conflict. So Africa, if we think about the continent, if we think about places that are mired in conflict, like Somalia, for example, right? You probably, how many of you have seen Black Hawk Down or heard of it? Maybe one or two people, right? Um, or if you think about the images that you may see from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, right? The whole idea is that, again, the state is only able to maintain order if it has a monopoly over violence, right? It means that you actually have the presence of an army to prevent 
right? Or to protect the state from external threats, but you also have a police force, right? That is responsible for protecting us from one another. So again, they're arguing about the whole idea of whether or not democracy will thrive, right? Um, in Africa, but most importantly in other parts of the world. And the whole idea is that, again, they're actually arguing that democracy, right, um, this belief held by scholars like Terry Lynn Carl and Felix Schmitter, right, they argue that the persistence of democracy um, and the spread of democracy globally through what we know as popular elections, electoral systems, and civil society, right, all of us organizing, working as groups to work as a counterbalance against the state or the state authority, right, um, actually creates this notion that democracy, right, while fragile in some countries around the world, think about Nigeria, think about Kenya, is really here to stay. So something stood out to me in terms of that um, debate that Dr. Dewisha and Dr. Hurst were having. Dr. Hurst actually argued that democracy in and of itself had won the intellectual argument. Meaning that if we think about countries around the world that are, right, that are authoritarian countries, countries like North Korea, right? If we ask the citizens on the ground, right, free from interference from the state, right, or fear of um, retribution by the government, they would actually argue that they want to live in a free society similar to what we have here. Right? They want to be able to walk freely, to engage in the freedom of expression, but also engage in voting, right? um, voting for a Yang gang or something of that sort. Right? They want to be involved in the political process. So the whole idea with this notion that he um, talked about, that democracy had won intellectual argument, stuck with me. And it made me think about this whole idea that, again, democracy, as it as a preferred mode of government all around the world, even in countries that may not have democracy yet. So Dr. Herbst reaffirmed the common argument made among political scientists that democracy remained at the apex of political and economic development. Because citizens imagined a world in which they were able to use the rule of law as the ultimate form of political freedom and expression, the inevitable forces of democracy could not be contained even under the worst of circumstances. In countries like Zimbabwe, democracy will ultimately, gradually over time, be regarded as a way of life free from the interference of tyrants or big men, um, as they're commonly known in African politics, of people like Robert Mugabe. So even in cases like Russia, where the state had obviously started out as a democracy, um, near the end of the ideological Cold War in 1989, established a democracy in the early 1990s, but by 2000 had moved back into this whole idea of a hybrid regime, where it was a balance between authoritarianism and democracy. The very presence of democratic institutions in places like Russia signaled the primacy of state authority over its citizens. So this actually raised an interesting question for me as a young scholar interested in looking at Africa, but most importantly, the whole idea of state building and democracy, whether or not there was a connection between the two, whether or not democracy could actually thrive in states that hadn't necessarily achieved the monopoly over violence, right? If you travel outside of the United States, you'll actually find that in most of the developing world, that outside of the major capitals, you really don't see the presence of a police force or a military. This is what I mean by the monopoly over violence. The ability of the state, right, to protect you, but also to impose its will, right? We stop at a stoplight because of the laws that govern us. But we know that if we run that stoplight, right, we face getting a ticket. This is, this shows the power of the state, but also the ways in which the state legitimizes its rule so that then we follow the laws. So the whole idea here is that, again, it reinforces an existing argument by Francis Fukuyama in the end of history that authoritarianism cannot prevent the spread of neoliberal economies and growing middle classes who would emerge demanding greater political freedoms. But most importantly, Herbst vaguely implied through democracy that the idea of the state would become, in the words of J.P. Nettle, more than the thing that exists undissolved by any amount of conceptual re restructuring. As a student of political science, 
This brought me to a quest to explore the dynamics of state building in my own research, particularly in Africa, where in the words of Achille Mbembe, the continent is often framed from what it lacks whether, rather than what it is. With development in economics and political sciences attempting to explain the reasons for this lack. So again, reinforcing the whole idea that when we think about Africa, we do not explain Africa or its states as it currently exists. We often frame it from a Western lens of what it lacks. A decade after my master's defense, it is clear that the enthusiasm for democracy has waned globally. A recent TED talk by Eric Lee in 2013 on the durability of Chinese authoritarianism argued that Western societies have lost a battle in dictating the terms of democracy, given China's spectacular economic growth and relative political stability. Recently, Freedom House released its annual Freedom of the World report in 2019, which argued that democracy had declined for the 13th consecutive year, with countries reversing from the gains made throughout the 1990s. From Venezuela's current and political economic collapse, to military regimes in Egypt and Thailand, to democratic backsliding in Turkey, Hungary, and Ukraine, democracy appears to be in crisis. In the more developed West, the rise of illiberal populism and far-right parties in Europe and the presence of big money politics and legislative deadlock in the United States continues to raise questions about the quality of democracy. Excuse me. Not only to protect individual freedoms, but to achieve social equity. Similarly, examples of state failure and collapse ranging from civil wars in South Sudan and Syria to the inability of national governments in Iraq and Afghanistan to, uh, to control power beyond their capitals directly challenge previously held ideas of the state to forge national identities and order through the monopoly on power. For scholars of comparative politics, the evolution of democracy from optimism to despair has left scholars scrambling to explain why states have failed to maintain democratic outcomes. The enthusiasm of Samuel Huntington's third wave from 1979, maybe to around 2005. And Samuel Huntington actually argued that democracy in and of itself, as a result of the end of the ideological Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, was inevitable. That globally, all countries in the world right, would start this slow march towards democracy. But what we see in 2019 is that more countries are moving away from democracy. They're becoming increasingly this hybrid model where you may vote in elections in a country like Zimbabwe, right? But you already know what the outcome is. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is that democracy once championed in the 1990s as a way of life for millions of people around the world is now in crisis. So the whole idea of Samuel Huntington's idea is that we have hybrid regimes which are neither wholly democratic or authoritarian, but they're now framed under certain typologies, competitive authoritarianism, electoral authoritarianism, or delegative democracies as typologies to describe these new configurations of state power. Although it was clear in states that the existing governments wanted to maintain control over political power, the attempt of states to legitimize their power through elections highlighted a unique blend of political liberalization and authoritarian control. The process of providing some freedoms at the expense of others deviates from conventional wisdom that argued initially that con economic collapse and the granting of limited political rights provided the basis for full democracy. While it can be argued that democracy, despite its characteristics, can be understood as having won the rule of the game in regions like Latin America, the question remains why it has failed to gain a foothold in Africa. So before I begin addressing the features of democracy and state building in Africa and the importance of Zimbabwe specifically, the broad contours of both analytical concepts should be addressed. Democracy can be best understood in regards to its institutional features, the process of free and fair elections, 
political participation through elected officials and the creation of political parties, rule for universal and inclusive suffrage, excuse me, or the right to vote, freedom of association, and the right to run for office. For political scientists, this definition of democracy embraces the idea that states not only meet the requirements of fair and inclusive elections, but also act to protect civil and political rights. Critical in the understanding of democracy is the fact that rulers are held accountable for their actions in the public arena and subject to public opinion and criticism regarding their performance through the ballot box. In turn, the state or state building right, is understood according to Max Weber as a direct consequence of armed conflict and war which establishes territorial borders and the consolidation of political power. Through the state's monopoly over violence, the state reinforces, according to Max Weber, organized dominion and obedience as a foundation for political, social, and economic life, which offer an idea as a state, as an institutional entity, which gradually rids itself of ethnic or tribal affinities in exchange for your national identity. So in the words of Samora Michel, um, the independence leader in Mo Mozambique, excuse me, in order for the state or the nation to live, your ethnicity must die. So in countries like Kenya, we have a challenge where people see themselves based on their ethnic group. They see themselves either as Kukuyu or Luo. They do not necessarily see themselves as Kenyan. But if the state had engaged in war, similar to the examples used in Europe, right, of developing states like France or Britain through war, we create a national identity. So we can look at French people and identify what French people look like. But in the case of Africa, people do not always see themselves as part of the nation that exists, partly because of the absence of the monopoly over violence. They may often see themselves as their ethnic group, what they are born into. But if a state is to implement democracy, then all of the citizens must see their, their ethnic identities as a sub-identity. It does not trump national identity. So for example, really quickly, when you have a, do you have a passport? On your passport, does it say African American? It does, as a marker? Or does it just say American? So it says African American, but the principal identity is American. Does that make sense? So this is nationalism and the monopoly over violence in the state at work because your identity as right, an African-American or Latino-American is a sub-identity. Your number one identity under the umbrella of the state is a national identity. So, in, in applying this Weberian definition or Max Weber's definition of the state to Africa, Jeffrey Herbst again argues that the period of, Af of excuse me, the period of independence in African states was a lost opportunity for states to develop in the same process of, as European states, given that the institutionalization of war and conflict creates state legitimacy and stability while forging a collective national identity. Instead, African states have been mired in an effort to overcome their political and eco economic backwardness, right, and I'll put that in air quotes, due in part to the framing of African states in comparison to the Weberian or European model of state building. States like Somalia, for example, have been framed as failed or collapsed states in the absence of the monopoly over violence or the inability to enforce contracts, to maintain law and order, security, but also the inability of the state to legitimize rule or deliver public goods. For scholars, African scholars like Zubar Y at the University of Ottawa, framing the state as, or framing African states, excuse me, as failures, this discourse of state failure reinforces a vulgar universalism of the state which obscures the challenges that states in Africa face in its political and economic development. If we follow these ideas of Max Weber towards state development, then we ahistoricize the particular path towards state development in Africa. 
It is important to remember that unlike the Weberian evolution of the state, in which war and conflict provided the foundation for the monopoly over violence and the foundations of the state in Europe, the state in Africa, as we know it, those 54 countries that we see on a map, was established through colonization, right? Through what we know as the Berlin Conference of 1884, 1885, in which European powers, having never visited the continent of Africa, knowing little about its linguistic history or its lineage, or its ethnic groups carved out Africa into separate countries. Often, if we think about countries like Rwanda and Burundi, often carving lines in between ethnic groups. So when we think about the Rwandan genocide in 1994, right, what we see is that, again, the creation of Rwanda right, under European control actually establishes right, the differences, ethnic differences, between the Hutus and Tutsis. Prior to European colonization, the Hutus and the Tutsis shared particular types of cultural affinities, in, including language and customs. So if we think about the way that these ethnic groups actually, um, excuse me, the way that these ethnic groups actually intermingled before European colonization and the creation of the state in Africa, most of these groups lived in harmony. It is only until the carving out and making of the state in Africa that then we have the types of problems of state building and these challenges in, of democracy that we see in African states today. Okay. Colonization in Africa was never sought to consolidate state power or build nationalism or identities in a manner which would gradually create the foundation for rational legal legitimacy, right? Um, or peaceful coexistence. To the contrary, the objective of colonialism, colonialism's external imposition of force, was to facilitate the expansion of violence and domination complementary to the processes of economic exploitation. For Peter E.K., scholar e. Peter E.K., colonialism involved the establishment of two publics, the civic public and the primordial public in which competing elites use violence against one another as a means of gaining state authority. If what we also examine, if we also examine the legacy of democracy across the continent, its mixed record of what Christopher Fomio argues as democratization by fits and starts has similar challenges. Beginning with the conference phenomenon in Benin in the early 1990s, popular protest movements led by labor unions, students, and new political parties gave promise to observers that democratic reforms in Africa were possible. Yet, for many countries throughout the continent, even as citizens went to the ballot box in initial elections, democracy would be compromised by entrenched political parties with long historical legacies. The failure of democracy in African states has to do with the failure of the first and second phases of African independence. The first phase throughout the 1960s, right, or beginning in 19, the late 1950s and extending almost into the, excuse me, extending into the late 1990s, offered nationalism as a foundation of national unity without the consolidation of state power in multi-ethnic societies like Kenya or Nigeria. In contrast, the second phase of African independence from the 1990s was marred by competitions for power between African elites caught between maintaining the state and their primordial or ethnic loyalties. In order to understand democracy and state building in African states, we have to pay attention to the role that colonial formations of the state have to play in creating authoritarian regimes. So essentially, what does this mean when it comes to Zimbabwe? How do we actually understand that the way that we envision or see states like Zimbabwe have a direct connection to the way that the state is actually established and formed? So if we think about the whole idea of um, colonialism influencing the development of African states, and impeding democracy in countries like Zimbabwe, which can be classified as an authoritarian regime, 
What we understand is that, again, the state in Zimbabwe was actually created through John Cecil Rhodes and the British South Africa Company in 1896. So this form of settler colonialism, meaning that in countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe, through settler colonialism, they believe, or those who colonized, those whites who colonized Southern Africa, in particular South Africa and Zimbabwe, believed that the state belonged to them. This is slightly different than the different forms of rule or colonial rule that we will find in other parts of Africa, such as indirect rule or direct rule, which again was informal control by European powers over African colonies. Meaning that if we think about countries like Senegal that gained its independence in 1960, the whole idea here is that when the Senegalese gained their independence, the French left but also kept informal economic relationships with Senegal. So this may be argued by some scholars of political science or some in development economics as neocolonialism, which is the indirect control over these states by controlling their economies. So if we think about states like Zimbabwe, the question then raises, right? How does Zimbabwe become an authoritarian regime? So if we think about colonialism and its impact, under the establishment of Rhodesia, named after John Cecil Rhodes. How many of you know about the Rhodes Scholarship? How many of you are applying for the Rhodes Scholarship? Hopefully, right? John Cecil Rhodes, the whole idea is that again, the Rhodes Scholarship is named after John Cecil Rhodes, who was responsible for the colonization, right, of Southern Africa. But even as the state was established in Rhodesia, the way that they maintained control was through a mixed form of coercion and consent, or what we know as violence and right, um, inducements or, or economic incentives, right? The creation of, in Zimbabwe, of a small yet powerful black middle class allowed right, Zimbabwe to remain controlled by white rule. This use of elites, this competition between creating a small sector of elites by colonial powers echoes the type of competition between elites that we can see in African countries today. Because early on, these elites learn from the colonial rulers that the competition for power rests in the state. So even in the places in the world, excuse me, even in places in Africa where we actually see democracy occurring, like Nigeria or Ghana, these parties, these political parties compete for power to gain control over the economic spoils of the state, right? In the words of Kwame Nkrumah, he actually argues, seek ye the political kingdom. The reason why he argues that if we seek the political kingdom is because the economic kingdom soon follows. So one's access to political power means that economic wealth follows. Right? So if we think about the removal of Robert Mugabe in November of, excuse me, in November of 2017, the whole goal here is that, again, Robert Mugabe, being 92 in age, right, um, relatively crafty but also rather senile, was controlled or had right, political power, but those who controlled power behind the scenes were named or understood as the securocrats. They were actually security officers or military officers who had gained economically, right? They owned land, they owned businesses, right? But it was all channeled through Robert Mugabe. So if Robert Mugabe is swept from power, then they also lose, right, all of the economic things that they had gained from having power from before. So this notion of maintaining political power is at the heart of why Democracy often fails in Africa, but also explains the long march that Africa has towards state building. One of the things that I'm flushing through and working on in my own research is the understanding of how political agreements between different types of elites allow countries to maintain their authoritarian rule, especially in Africa. So what we understand from examining Zimbabwe through the colonial masters 
is that, again, we can think about Lancaster House Agreement of 1980, in which whites who are exiting power negotiate with blacks, right, the two black political parties led by Joshua Nkomo and Robert Mugabe as a means of maintaining all of the economic spoils that they had gained as a result of colonialism. But also, they use, on the way out, they inflict violence on the guerrilla movements, right, which then, gradually, as blacks assume power in Zimbabwe, is also perpetuated against their own people, but also used to marginalize other political parties. And this is a cycle of violence that originates in our colonial history, but is maintained in the contemporary era. So when we think about colonialism, or we think about state building and democracy, we have to ask a larger question. Where are the origins? of this? Where did it come from? How did a state's history or development influence the way that it exists on a map today? When we think about authoritarian states like China or other states, how does its history influence the way that it is at present? So here's some of the challenges that I'll offer. The whole idea is that, again, Zimbabwe has maintained not only through force or violence, but also through the construction of ideologies. They call it the first Kaimaringa, or the Kaimaringa, which is a Shona word that also talks about revolutionary struggle. The first Kaimaringa was actually in 1896, 1897, in which the Shona people engaged in war against John Cecil Rhodes and right, the British South Africa Company, in which they lost. But again, this whole idea of patriotic history is constantly revisited by the government of Robert Mugabe and those who still control Zimbabwe, right, under the Zimbabwe African National Union, right, um, or ZANU, right, um, through this whole idea of revolutionary struggle. The second Kamarango was actually from 1970 to 1980, in which Zimbabweans engaged in military or guerrilla warfare to reclaim their country from white rule. But the final one is most important because it talks about this whole notion of how the state uses and perpetuates violence to, again, limit democracy. In 2000, Robert Mugabe faces opposition in a democracy where citizens are moving towards a national vote from a political party known as the Movement for Democratic Change. And in the third Kaimaringa, which he argues is a revolutionary struggle to reclaim the land seized, right, or land seized from blacks through the first revolutionary struggle in which um, colonization occurs, Robert Mugabe uses patriotic history and uses his influence as a national hero to again use violence against his own people but also to expel all whites from the country. This leads to the economic collapse of Zimbabwe, and it reinforces the authoritarian nature of the state that exists today in Zimbabwe. So what are some of the takeaways that we can learn from this connection between state building and democratization? The first is pretty simple, is that if we think about Africa and how we championed democracy in the 1990s, we actually believe right, that democracy as a set of ideas is premature in Africa and hijacks the whole idea of building the state, building a national identity in African states, but most importantly, building safe and secure states, which then have people who are bound by a national identity. So the language that institutions like the IMF and the World Bank use to describe this euphoria around democracy ultimately allows authoritarian leaders in many countries, not just in Africa, but many countries around the world to maintain power. It is how they push this development agenda, moving away from this balance between the United States and the Soviet Union to now focus on right, this development of democracy right, in exchange for economic aid. So one of the things that happens is that as we push democracy, we ignore the development of the state in Africa, which then creates the persistence of authoritarianism. So my solution 
is not only to look at the historical evolution of these states and how they come to be authoritarian or democratic, but also to look at the role of citizens in bottom up. How do citizens actually envision their society becoming from the bottom up? How do they actually engage right, um, in acknowledging their religion, their ethnicity, their clan? Right? How do these social structures actually matter in societies that are heterogeneous or multi-ethnic? How does the state respond to that? But then also, if we think about here in the United States, when we talk about our diverse issues in this country, like immigrants, how the, what's the responsibility of the state of including all of its citizens through a national identity, but also right, making them more productive citizens? What's the relationship between citizens and the state to make them more productive citizens? I'll stop there. I always say I'm better at questions, so ask away. Yes, go for it. Sure. <laughs> Sure, I think that, um, that's a great question by the way. I think that again, one of the things that we expect, um, well, I'll, I'll put it this way and we'll use a little bit of foreign policy. 9-11 was the first time that Americans started to actually look at the world, right? Um, and it was because of the attack on American soil. But if you really think about it, we had not paid attention to the types of policies, right? Um, before 9-11 that our government um, actually implemented in other parts of the world. So I think that if we think about Zimbabwe, right, and we think about its history in terms of creating the authoritarian state in Zimbabwe, it's easy to call Robert Mugabe um, a tyrant, right? But at Lancaster House, the Americans um, were highly involved in brokering a deal between um, the white power structure at the time under the Rhodesian Front and um, the, uh, the guerrilla fighters of ZANU and ZAPU, for example. Um, so I think that one of the things that we can do as Americans by learning this history and learning about different places of the world is to uncover our role in it, right? Um, as Americans, as young Americans who are actually voting in the next set of elections, who you elect and what they think about foreign policy um, creates long-lasting effects that may linger for years. So it's important, and this is something that I teach to all my students in comparative politics and international relations, is that we need to understand the world because the large majority of our policies may reinforce not colonial practices, but in many ways, neo-colonial practices, right? Um, there's a saying that if we think about the Rwandan genocide, um, that the United States failed to intervene in the Rwandan genocide because America didn't have friends, they had interests. But if you think about 900,000 people dying in the span of 90 days because of widespread violence, right? Isn't it our responsibility to intervene in these places? Isn't it our responsibility as Americans to be aware of what's going on in the world, but also, right, um, provide the checks and balances to our, our elected officials? So I think one of the things in uncovering histories um, about places like Zimbabwe and its history of colonialism, it does, it empowers us about the world because I firmly believe that all of, the of you in here will find yourselves, right, in one of these places in the world. And it's just intellectual curiosity, so. Sure. Sure. So I got lucky. Um, I uh, got a scholarship in between high school um, in college to study in Ecuador. So I lived in Ecuador for about a year and a half. 
Um, my friends were Afro-Ecuadorian. I assumed that everybody was black. Um, well, all my friends were black to that point. Um, but I assumed that Afro-Ecuadorians had a similar history. Right? I believe that they were slaves too. Right? And that's what I argued. I remember being in a history class and arguing that with my friend. Like, you were slaves too. And he was like, no, our history's totally different. Right? In fact, he came from a family of marooned um, or um, shipwrecked um, Africans on the coast of Esmeraldas and Sua, who then married and merged with local Indians. And also, um, his grandparents, or excuse me, his great grandparents actually fought with Simon Bolivar in liberating Ecuador. So it was a unique history. And I think once I got to college, one of the things that I wanted to understand was more of how the diaspora worked. So I wanted to understand where I was in the world, but also um, how. Um, we claim to be, right, quote unquote, African Americans, as you identified, right? But what does that really mean? Do we share commonalities with people in Africa, or do we just share, right, this common history that we connect back to slavery, right? Which is something that we kind of connect through tragedy almost, right? But what else do we know about the continent? So that exploration, you know, took me to learn more about the world. I became an international affairs major, um, was really interested in becoming a diplomat at some point. Um, and then caught the bug from a professor of mine to really study Africa and, and work on my PhD. But then I also studied at the University of Cape Town. And that was pivotal too in examining Zimbabwe and South Africa. Because at that time, um, this was 2001, um, they actually had like land squatting. So in Zimbabwe, the thing that I'm talking about with the land seizures and the third Kai Moringa was actually happening in real time. So to be in South Africa and watch this occur on the news, right? Um, I never thought that it would be a research puzzle that I would spend my life working on. So you know, this is something that you're doing in all of your classes. I would urge you to really find that research puzzle that you're interested in, and then see how you can carry that further. All right? Because anything can be connected to what you do, right? I mean, how many of you heard this um, song "Narcos" by Migos? Anybody? Right, narcos, narco trafficking, state capacity, right? Goes back to what I'm talking about, state building, right? The reason why, right, we have narco trafficking in Mexico is partly because of the absence, right, of the monopoly over violence, right? And corruption, right? This is endemic in developing countries, right? So again, my man, we can connect anything that we learn, right? Including what we listen to, right? To what's going on in the world, if we dig enough. Yes. Hi. Um, so I hope I can do that. But um, I noticed that one of the things that you discussed was talking about how a lot of uh, what I was mentioning earlier with the hate that uh, it's been in the situation of the authority, um, like indigenous, and you know, they're like trying to um, to be the victim of their ethnicity, religion, just differences of their own nationality. So I was a bit curious. Sure, good question. So this is the number one challenge of the state, right? And especially states that I mentioned, like Nigeria, um, Ghana, for example. Um, you know, very few countries in Africa actually have the luxury of building a state, right, um, that is homogeneous, right? And this goes back to the distinctions between the Weberian or European example, Max Weber, um, I actually coined the idea of the state as a monopoly over violence, right? He talks about the whole idea that war creates European states and creates a singular identity or a national identity, right? Whereas in Africa, because again, right, the state was actually imposed on it, right? We do have struggles with religious identities, right? We, or ethnic identity, right? And I think that that is persistent and it will be pervasive, right? Because you're born into your ethnic group, right? That's not something that you easily um, take away. Um, one of the things that I think these African states are attempting to do, right, if we think about the rainbow nation in South Africa, is really to build nation building by recognizing and identifying national um, ethnic identities, right, and making sure that the level field is, is fair for all ethnic groups. And I think that this is a challenge of state building and democracy, right? State building, as we know it now, does not have to come in, in, the, in the European example of war and conflict. Right? But it does have to come through consensus building. Right? And ethnic groups being able to share power 
rather than take power off of themselves. So this is a lingering question that I'm exploring in my own work. How much power does one ethnic group need over the other, right? Or can they share power, right? And we see positive examples of that. Like Nigeria, we see a democratic turnover between ethnic groups um, and political parties that are largely ethnicized, right? But also in Ghana. So democracy can work. And we can do it in a way that then recognizes right, different ethnic groups and different religious affinities. Right? So I think that state building and democracy can work. And the whole idea is to move away from what y, Zubari Y talks about, this vulgar universalism. Right? Because the West developed this way, it does not mean that the developing world also has to follow the same trajectory. Right? Allow the, the developing world to create its own path. Nobody? Told you I'm better at questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, I was also Sure. Sure. So one of the things that we fail to examine, even when we think about the evolution of European states and state building and democracy, is that it usually comes through those forms of authoritarianism. Right. So one of the things that we do have to acknowledge as a cost of development right, in these countries, well, let's take a country like, uh, for example, Haiti. Right? We think about uh, um, Baby Doc and Papa Doc Duvalier, right? and the Tantan Mukuts, or the secret police that use violence right? um, against their own people. Right? The state has to create the monopoly over violence, again, to gain, well, to gain legitimacy, that people have to recognize state authority in that way. The challenge, though, is that, again, the way that we want the world to develop is that we want the continent of Africa and its states to truncate that process of development. So if we think about European powers and the United States, right, it took right, several centuries to develop what we now know as the monopoly over violence. But it came through the exclusion of rights for particular types of groups. Right? For example, like African Americans, if we think about an American example, right? um, or Native Americans, right? as another example. Right? So the whole idea here is that, again, we have universal ideas of what the state should be. But there's a path to development, right? The, the question that I'm raising here in this talk is not only, right, to speak for, not to speak for the developing world, but to speak to them, right? And to also provide a voice to critique those leaders like Robert Mugabe who are using force and violence indiscriminately against their own people, right? Mugabe can be an example, even though he's no, more, no longer in power, right? We can also um, talk about people like Emerson Manangagwa, Right, who was known as the crocodile and was the main henchman right, for allowing Robert Mugabe to stay in power for 27 years. Right? So how do we hold these leaders accountable? Not just those citizens fighting on the ground, but how, do, how does the global community hold them accountable? Right? And then create more pressure so that these people are actually removed from power. Right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Turkey, for instance. Yes. With them being a part of the UN, how do you see anyone actually basically stopping the genocide to things that take place over there? So you're talking about, like, uh, for example, like what Turkey's doing right now? Turkey, uh, in Syria. Yeah, in Syria. Right. Right. So the. Uh, 
point, good point. So one of the things that we have to acknowledge in terms of state building and democracy is the whole idea of great power politics, right? We know that there are stronger countries in the world that control, right, the affairs of what we know as small powers, right? Um, China, Russia, right, um, the United States, France, Britain, right, all of these countries kind of sit, right, on the United Nations Security Council. Right? And they, right, um, because they are the powerful countries in the, in the, in the world, right, both militarily and economically, right, they decide what happens in these small powers. Right? And this goes back to the whole idea that I talked about earlier, right, that the United States doesn't have friends, it has interests. Does that make sense? So strategically, the United States, just like China or any other country, like Russia, for example, we think about um, what's going on um, in Turkey and Syria. Right? Part of it, right, the part of this, um, um, continuance of conflict, right, um, or the extermination of the Kurds, right, is again partly based on domestic politics if we think about Turkey, right. Um, the Kurdish party or the BAM Kurdish party, the PKK, um, has always pushed for its own self-determination and wants to create a Kurdish state. But the problem with the Kurds is that Kurdish people as a stateless nation reside in several states throughout the Middle East. So to create their own state, you actually lead to the disintegration of several states. So the number one thing that the state, once it's built, attempts to do is maintain its territorial integrity at all costs. Does that make sense? So the whole idea of these states that exist in the map, even if we think about Somalia, is to not break up the way that we see it on the map. Even though if we look inside Somalia, right, there's two autonomous regions, Puntland and Somaliland. So these states are relatively autonomous, and there's no central government in Somalia. But the question is, why does this still remain on the map? It is because we don't want the, the residual effects of creating more states. If we actually broke down Africa, just to get to the example, right, we'd probably have anywhere, scholars estimate anywhere from three to 5,000 small states based on ethnicity, not these 54 countries that we have now. Right? But also, based on interest, one, if we think about the Turkish case, but also based on the whole idea of sovereignty, that states have the authority to do what they wish within their borders. Right? There is a growing consensus around the responsibility to protect, which occurred after the Rwanda, Rwanda genocide, that urges, in the case of crimes against humanity, where violence is being perpetuated by the state against its own people, right? that people who are unable to protect themselves may then have foreign intervention. But that's rare. Does that make sense? So the whole idea is questioning the usefulness of international organizations like the United Nations. And that might be a good research topic for you um, if you think about PhD work in the future. I shouldn't qualify this question before I'm trying to clarify. Sure. Myself. Um, so, yeah, it's a matter of the distance between the authoritarian and the negative. Yes. I think so. Rather than allow it a, a kind of a conflict or tension that would produce ultimate mass Yeah. I, well, I think if we think about Africa, it depends on the region. Does that make sense? So if we think about, um, for example, we think about countries like Angola and Mozambique, right? They are now moving into what we would frame as state building, right? They, people identify as Angolans or Mozambicans, but we're coming off of nearly three decades of civil war, right? So to some degree, that idea that Jeffrey Herbst talked about in his book, Empower in Africa, right, where the only way to right, save the Congo is to forget that it exists, right, and allow them to actually engage in conflict to then cement power and build a national identity has some validity. But the larger question that I would ask as a scholar of African politics is what, at what cost, right? What cost of human life? Are we actually talking about establishing a state? And I think that other examples, more positive examples, may be Ghana or Kenya or Nigeria, in which they have punctuated periods, if we think about Nigeria, of military rule. But gradually over time, people start to realize that the fight wasn't with each other or these different ethnic groups. The fight was against the military rulers. So the whole idea was to kick out the military rulers. Right? So I think that gradually over time, right, the persistence of citizens on the ground and envisioning what society looks like for them, 
what democracy looks like, what the state looks like, what state building looks like from the bottom up will then build consensus, right? Because no authoritarian government can kill everybody. I hate to use such a crude term, right? But they need, right, the participation of citizens, right, in order to maintain, right, that um, the, the monop well, their authority over, right, the rest of society. Sure. Sure, throw it in. We do. <laughs> we do. Um, interestingly enough, so I was in Zimbabwe two years ago, and um, there's a famous guy um, by the name of Strive Siwa. He's the wealthiest man in Zimbabwe. Um, he fought a national court case to um, build his own cell phone company. Um, he actually argued that it was against his freedom of speech not to create his cell phone company. Um, he was persecuted by Robert Mugabe, but the judge who presided over the case went to Morehouse. So Morehouse is a global school. Um, we have a lot of students from all over the Caribbean, Africa, Latin America, um, and it's a phenomenal place. Um, but yeah, but we have a lot of international students. Um, yeah. I imagine you have a lot of troops too, Africa, sponsored through. Yes. Yes. Yes, they can. They can. So we have trips all over from South Africa to Costa Rica, to Ghana. So if you're interested in those trips, let's talk about it. But also, too, one more thing. Um, again, I love Georgia Southwestern. I had an amazing time when I was a professor here. Um, I would have stayed if they offered me a job. Um, but, but I would like to encourage all of you to see the world and travel. Um, it is vital as Americans. It is vital that you understand the world as it exists and that you travel and see it, right? Don't just believe what you're reading on the news, right? Take your time and look at other news sources. Look at Al Jazeera, right? Um, look at, um, how many of you look at Vice, for example? I use Vice all the time in teaching in my class, right? Um, wide ranging issues like the legalization of marijuana, Uruguay to whatever, right? So um, these are um, noisy, for example. You wanna learn about global culture, right? Um, dance hall in Jamaica, right? Really um, use the internet to your advantage to learn about different places in the world. Um, it's important. Also, television um, shows. Um, Ms. Fields, who, who's visiting. What's the name of the show that we saw on Netflix really quickly? The British show, um, Top, Top Boy, is that it? Right, have you guys? Look at Top Boy, great glimpse in the um, English grind culture. If you're interested in that, um, but the whole idea is that, again, right, use everything that you have outside the classroom to create a global worldview. That's my encouragement to you. Um, please do that. Travel, see the world as often as you can. But if you can't see it right now, please read about it. Is that it? Thank you.